Sunday is that special time for us to get together and study the Word of God. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our presentation of Give Me the Bible. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on Give Me the Bible. Well, good morning, and it's time for Give Me the Bible once again. And thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us today in our presentation of God's Word. You know, there's so many things to be said about our Lord God in heaven. Many things that we need to be reminded of daily. One of them is, is that our God is love. He is always there for us, and how thankful and grateful we are. This morning, we want to go in and get right into the program. Uh, time certainly is a factor, as it always is right here on Give Me the Bible. We have a lot of information that we want to share with you. And we're going to go to Brother Buddy Ray right now. And, and Buddy, I know a lot of people say, well, you know, God knows my heart. Is that good or is that bad? What do you think? Well, Dan, if we are doing what our Lord commands us to do, and we're living a life of obedience, and we're following in his footsteps, then I would say that certainly it is good that he knows our heart. If, on the other hand, we have chosen not to follow his commandments, not to live according to his will, and to not walk in the light with him, then it can be bad. But we need to understand this morning that the Lord does know my heart. Yes, he does. I encourage you to get your Bibles this morning, to follow along with each speaker that comes to look and to Test that to make sure that it's coming from the Word of God and that truly it is inspired by God and that we are speaking nothing but the truth. Here on Give Me the Bible. If you open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 tells us that the Word of God is quick and powerful. It said it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts and it separates even the joint and the marrow and the soul and the spirit. And at the end of that verse, it said that it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So you see the Word of God, Jesus Christ, who in John chapter 1 it said in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was with God. And that Word cuts our heart. It pricks the hearts to do what is right. So certainly God knows our heart. Look at verse 13 in that same chapter. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and naked to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You see, there's no secret with us. God knows our heart. God sees into our heart. He knows all of the unknown thoughts. He knows everything that goes on with us. And certainly, we're going to stand before our God one day, and it says that he knows all of it. Everything is open to his eyes, and we must give an account to him. I encourage you now to turn your Bibles back to Matthew, the 15th chapter. And we'll look real quickly at something else about the heart that, that we know as we look it in. In Matthew, chapter 15. Go with me to verse 18, and it says these words as Jesus is speaking. It said in verse 18, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. You see, as a man thinketh, so he is. And it says that everything that proceeds out of my mouth comes from the heart. Those are the things that defile a man. Verse 19 says, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. These are things which defile a man. So this morning, I would encourage you, you look into your own heart. Is it a good heart? Is it one that blessings are coming from? Is it a heart that leads us to follow the commandments of Jesus Christ and to walk after him? If not, make your heart right with God. Obey his gospel call. Be baptized for the remission of your sins and then live a faithful life until the day you die. But be assured of this today. God knows my heart, and I will stand before him and give an account. Well, amen. And that is sure, my friend. It is true. And if that is the case, and we need to understand, uh, and we're going to call him Brother Perry Cowan here momentarily, uh, to talk to us a little bit more about our heartfelt relationship uh, with God. You know, uh, Buddy touched on something that's very important. Right here on Give Me the Bible, we always point you to the Word of God. There are very few religious programs 
who will actually read the Bible, as we do on this program, and actually quote from the Bible and point you to biblical passages uh, that we use on this program. I would challenge every televangelist to do the same. Quit the nonsense about sending your money as seed faith. Show me that in the Word of God, anywhere. How ridiculous could one be? Well, let's go to Brother Perry Cowan. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, friends, for tuning in to Give Me the Bible. Friends, God does know our hearts, just as, as uh, Buddy has just so ably explained uh, a moment ago. What we must do is to realize that our hearts reveal who we really are. So it's important that they be guided by the Word of God. Jesus said, recorded in Matthew chapter 6, beginning at the 19th verse, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and thieves break through and steal. But rather, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust does not corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What kind of treasures are you laying up? Each of us are laying up treasures, but why and what for? Are they things that are designed to make us more successful? Are they designed to make us more comfortable in this world? Remember what John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. I'd like for us to consider briefly some Bible passages. Dan said we refer you back to the Bible. Look at what Solomon said in Proverbs 23. Do not overwork to be rich. Because of your own understanding, cease. Uh, in other words, he said, if you understand this, stop. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Paul said to Timothy in chapter 6 of the first letter with this encouragement, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches, that's the riches of the world. They're uncertain. They're all going to disappear. They're going to be burned up with a fervent heat when time comes. The Hebrew writer said, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. But don't we oftentimes find that difficult to do? Uh, there's a hymn that we oftentimes sing. It starts out like this. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below. Just a little silver and a little gold. Are we really? Are we really satisfied with just a cottage, just a little silver and gold? And if we are, why do we keep trying to get more and more and bigger and bigger? We need to be satisfied with the riches that God has given us because God knows our heart and our treasure is where our heart is. And our heart is where our treasure is. Dan? Well, Perry, you are right. And, uh, you know, because of the quest for wealth and for the things of this world, we have become a debtor nation. The folks up in Washington know very little about how to run the affairs of our nation. From the White House <laughs> to the House of Justice. Even sometimes, I must admit, our own homes, our own houses, because we are focused on the wrong thing. We're going to go to Brother Barry Haynes right now. And uh, Barry, where should we be focused? And, uh, you know, what about this concept of a heartfelt relationship? You know, we need to ask ourselves the question, do we really love God before anything or anyone else? How much do do we truly love God? You know, there was Steve Martin uh, had a stand-up career for many years where he got into movies and television, and he used to have this bit. He actually put it in one of his movies where at the part of the end of his show, he would talk, he'd get mad at the audience, and he'd say to him, I don't need anything or anybody, and he'd start to storm off, and he'd say, I don't need anything at all except for, and he'd pick up some random item that would be there, some glass or some ashtray. I don't need anybody but this glass. I don't need anything but this. And he'd, he'd keep doing it as he walked out until eventually as he was leaving the door, he'd have arms full of stuff, but he didn't need anything or anybody. You know, I think sometimes that's the way we are towards God. We say, 
I don't put anything before God. I love God before anything else, but yet we grab all these other things and try to put it before him. But you know, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 10, in verses 37 through 39, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. He who has lost his life for my sake will find it. So Jesus says some very challenging things here. He says we have to love him more than our possessions. He says we have to love him more than our family. How important is our family, our children to us? But Jesus says, I have to be more than that to you. I have to, you have to love me more than that. Even your own life. You see, it's because God has always demanded first place. We may wonder, what, what, where, where does God deserve to be? Well, he deserves to be at the top. You know that command, that first command that he gave in Exodus chapter 3, verse 10, that first of those 10 commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. You know, we think of that as, as the false idols of the world, but you know, the Bible says greed is a form of idolatry. There are a lot of things that we place before God that we say, well, I love God, but we add to it, right? I don't, I love God more than anything except this. I love God anything more except we put our job before it or our kids, or our hobbies. How many times do we see that happening in our lives? Just like that silly comic. We, we say we don't need anything else, but we're completely committed that we love God more than anything else, but yet it seems like everything else works in before Him. We see that in our worship, how we'll miss just about, we'll, we'll miss worship for just about anything. We see in our lives, we'll, we'll give to any other cause except for God. Do we really love God more than anything else? Then he has to be first place. Well, Barry, thank you. You know, we often say, a man may say to his wife, Honey, I love you with all of my heart. Do you? Does she know it? She knows it by your actions. And if your actions are not demonstrative of what you say, then she perceives you don't really love her with all of your heart. So Jerry uh, Munholland, this morning, uh, why is it so important for us to activate those things in our lives? And is the walk really that important to the talk? <laughs> well, Dan, that is a great question to ask. And so it is, it's just much more than just following our heart. You know, Dan said about the husband saying to a wife, wife, I love you with all my heart. Well, I, that reminded me of a story it was that a young man was having trouble with his marriage and he's going to therapy. And he said to the therapist, you know, I, I, I love my wife and, and with all my heart. And the therapist went to explore that and he said, well, how is it that you know that you love your wife with all your heart? He said, well, the first time I saw her, I just had this great feeling in my heart, and, and, I, and I just knew that it was love and great love there. And the therapist looked seriously at him and said, you know, it, it might not have been love that you felt. It might have been indigestion that was there. So how do we know that our heart and following our heart is true when our heart can be deceitful? Then listen to what the Bible says in, in Jeremiah chapter 17. It said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so it must be that as we follow our heart, it must be that we do not follow a deceitful heart, but we must be in common with what we feel and what we do. Be consistent in what we feel and what we do. If we're going to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then be consistent in what we do with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so it's just not following a feeling, but it is a doing. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, when we read there, to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. So there is a trusting and doing and so it, it is trusting that he will guide you but it's also following the path that he directs us on 
trusting him with all our heart means following him with all our heart, doing with all our heart. And if you turn the page in my Bible, we go to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. It says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. What he's saying is guard your heart. Put a wall around your heart. Protect your heart as you follow your heart. Discern what goes into your heart and what goes out of our heart. We, we know that as we, we read Psalm 119, verse 10 and verse 11, David would say, with my whole heart I sought you. And then he said in verse 11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It's not just following God with all your heart, but it's doing the things that God would lead us and guide us diligently with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Don't just say it. Do it. Now back to you, Dan. Well, Jerry, the proof is in the pudding, isn't it? In the eating. And, uh, you know, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, and acts like a duck, it must be a duck. And if you shower your love upon other people, unselfish, undaunting love, then it must really be love. You know, George Strait sang a song several years ago entitled, I Cross My Heart. You know, sometimes people say that and they say, I cross my heart, but sometimes you have to wonder where they've crossed their fingers instead of their heart. He said in that song, there's no love any purer than mine. I hope that's the kind of love you have for God. We're going to call on Chris Grota right now. And, and Chris, uh, uh, share with us a, a few more thoughts about the heart and the fact that God really knows it. God knows our hearts so well, we know that we need to repent of sins because we're going to give a, an account before him one day in the judgment. But I want to give you some examples of repentance in the Bible because Simon the sorcerer is a great case, a great classic case of, of an example of repentance in the Bible. In Acts chapter 8, you can read about this man who used to be a sorcerer. And I can imagine that seeing how that the Holy Spirit was given by the laying on of apostles' hands, he must have been tempted by that. And the Bible says that he offered them money so that whomever he laid his hands, the Holy Spirit could be given as well. I think he'd like to have had that. And of course, that was a sinful thought because that wasn't within the plan and, and purview of God. And, and Peter says, your money perishes with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You see, it's not what, the, what Simon the sorcerer did. It's what he thought that was sinful, and he still needed to repent of it. And he says, you don't have any part or lot in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray that the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. He says, I perceive that you're in the, in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And in the next verse, it says, would you please pray for me that the things that you talked about wouldn't come upon me? I don't want that. You see, he, he wanted to repent. Repentance is a change of thinking, and it's usually uh, going to lead to a change of action. It's, a, it's doing a 180. And, and since godly sorrow, 2 Corinthians 7 tells us, produces repentance, we can know that Simon the sorcerer was rebuked to the point of godly sorrow. And not wanting to displease God, he changed his thinking and he changed his ways and he repented. And, and you know, that's what we've got to do. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 10, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of his son cleanses us of our sins, from all of our sins. And if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We're to confess our sins. We say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And so we need to be brave enough to admit when we are wrong. And God cannot forgive and will not forgive us when we don't repent. If our pride says we haven't sinned, then our pride is going to get in the way of God's forgiving us of our sin. You see, the point is this. As, as Christians, we're supposed to love less the world and love God more and in in fact, when we do that, we will sin less. Not be sinless, but sin less. And so let's not love the world nor the things that are in this world. 1 John 2, verse 15. Back to you, Brother Dan. Well, Chris, we are 
grateful this morning for those words of encouragement, and I know that uh, you are as well. And uh, we want to go to our last speaker here today. Uh, last but not least is uh, our dear friend Scout Betts from over in Lufkin, Texas. And uh, Scout, you know, David could truthfully and honestly say, Lord, search me and know my heart. But can we truthfully do that today? Would we want God to really search our hearts? Well, let me tell you something. Doesn't he know our heart, whether we invite him to search our heart or not? Psalm 139, verse number 1, is certainly going to lead to that conclusion. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down, verse number 2, and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. You see, the Lord knows our hearts already. What is beautiful about the text of Psalm 139 is as you continue to read through the Psalm of David there, at the end, or towards the end of verse number 23, he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. It's not that God didn't know him. It's that David is now willing to let God search his heart. Do we really want the Lord to search our hearts, though? Search me, O God, and know my heart. A question we must be brutally honest about. If we're not letting God search our hearts willingly, that means we're purposefully shutting him out of our lives. It's not that it's going to stop him from knowing our hearts. He knows. But if we begin to callous our hearts, he's going to know that as well. You think about working with your hands. Maybe it is that you, you enjoy gardening. Maybe it is you go to the gym and you get those calluses on your hands right there. That's from putting in the work to do that. But if you look at it this way, if we're going to compare it, we're putting in work if we're shutting out God to callous our own hearts. We don't want to be those who, who shut him out. We want to be those who let God in. Can we be like David, the psalmist, and truly desire for God to know and to search our hearts? But the question is, what is he going to find within? What's going to be the result of God searching our hearts? Is it going to be that we are living for ourselves? That we are truly uh, going about doing things the way we want to do them? We're not actually striving to do the things of God. Is it going to be that God is second thought to us. It's not that he is he takes priority, he's not the first in our lives, or is it going to be that he reigns there? He is always welcome, if you will. Are we going to be found faithful like our brethren in the book of Revelation chapter 2 verse number 10? We should always remember and do well to remember that verse number 1 of Psalm 30, 139 clearly tells us you've searched me and you know me. The Lord knows our hearts already, and with that knowledge, we need to do something about it. We need to be those who not only let the Lord search our hearts, we need to be those who are searching after the things of God. Dan? Well, Scout, thank you very much. And uh, we're so thankful and grateful today that you've joined us for our telecast here of Give Me the Bible. I want to remind you once again about the free DVD We'll send it to you postpaid. There is no cost. We'll send it to you. Honestly, you don't have to seed, send, uh, send seed faith money. It is free of charge. We'll make sure that you get it, and uh, you will learn much as a result of it. It's just uh, free of charge, so please call that number that appears on the screen here momentarily. And also, by the way, write for the, or call us for the uh, Give Me the Bible. Uh, actually, it's a correspondence course. And it will take you through the Bible in eight study lessons, and you'll learn much as a result of it. There's a little self-help test on the back. You'll complete that, check it, uh, send it in, and then we'll grade it and send it back to you. And after you complete the eight-lesson study, then we'll give you a certificate showing that you had completed this correspondence course. Again, we thank you so much for joining us today. I do want to tell you that many preachers get on television and tell you that all you have to do is to let Jesus come into your heart. I want to dispel that this morning because the Bible just does not teach that. Uh, many people have heard that so long that they actually believe it. Uh, if you can find anywhere in the Word of God that Jesus ever said, let me come into your heart, 
uh, please send that scripture to us. We'll be happy to entertain it right here on Give Me the Bible. But you will not find it. You will find that we are to believe in him and that we are to obey from the heart the word of God in the book of Romans chapter 6 and obey the gospel by being baptized for the remission of your sins. I hope that you'll call us, you'll write us, send us an email, tell us about your desire to know more about God. I'm Dan Manuel. I've been your host and moderator today, and thank you for joining us, and please join us next week at this same time for another presentation of Give Me the Bible. Sing the sweetest song of all.